Welcome to Paranormal Yakko. You are invited to join me, your host, Stan Mallow, each week when I interview a different guest of note in their respective field. The unexplained, the mysterious, the macabre, UFOs, ghosts, Bigfoot, psychic phenomena. We explore them all on Paranormal Yakker. Hi, everyone. I'm Stan Mallow, the Paranormal Yakker. My guest on today's show is Preston Dennett. He is a field investigator for MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, a ghost hunter, a paranormal researcher, the author of 30 books and more than 100 articles on UFOs and the paranormal. I've had the privilege of interviewing Preston many times over the years, and two things are always a given. His books are consistently great reads and the covers of them are consistently outstanding works of art worthy of being in a museum. They're incredible. I'll be talking with Preston about his book, Extraterrestrial Visitations, True Accounts of UFO Contact. Preston Dennett, welcome to Paranormal Yakker. Thanks, Stan. Thanks for having me on. It's always a pleasure. You, Preston, have been investigating UFOs and the paranormal for quite some time. When did your interest in exploring the UFO phenomenon and the paranormal begin, and what transpired in your life to trigger that interest? I was actually really lucky. I got involved in this field when I was quite young, 21 years old. Came into this field as a skeptic, very scientifically minded, very analytical, not a believer in UFOs, really at all. That all changed, of course. I remember the exact date, November 17, 1986. There was a report in the news about a sighting over Alaska, and it shocked me because this was a commercial Japanese airliner where the whole crew saw a UFO, which followed their plane for many miles, for over half hour, and was on radar. Now, this actually wasn't in the news report, which was very short. They kind of just joked about this guy and uh, moved on. But it interested me enough because my brother, Mark, my older brother, had said he'd seen a UFO. That was a good five years before this when I was a teenager and I didn't believe him. I just did not. But now hearing this report in the news, it interested me enough to ask my brother Mark what he quote thought he saw. I was kind of rude about it being a skeptic. I just assumed these people were lying. But I know my brother Mark well enough to know that he's not going to lie to me. And he described this incredible sighting of a metallic craft, pretty much your classic flying saucer that colored lights on it, a dome on top, it was at treetop level, very close to him. And he chased it in his car. This is the story he told me. He says, I chased it for 15 minutes. It would stop, wait, he'd catch up to it, and it would dart ahead. I'm like, you're kidding. He says, no, no. I passed other cars. They were looking at it too. And he had two friends with him, Phil and Greg. Those were his friends. I knew them. I knew them pretty well. He's like, you should ask them. They will verify my story, which is exactly what I did. So that's my introduction kind of to the field and found out that I had a number of family members, several friends, co-workers, many who had really dramatic encounters. I mean, seeing grays face to face, missing time, the whole deal. That's what got me to start buying books on this phenomena. I started interviewing people. I joined the Mutual UFO Network, MUFON, became a field investigator. By ni- I think that was around 1988, about a year and a half in. I was fully immersed in this. Yeah, joined every organization I could find. I wanted to get to the bottom of this mystery. Extraterrestrial visitations, true accounts of UFO contact, represents the cutting edge of UFO research with 10 new and original first accounts of close encounters with UFOs and aliens. What resources, Preston? And do you use in compiling the cases detailed in the book? These were all people who contacted me or people I perhaps knew, people who came forward to me from after I spoke about this subject or heard me on the radio. I had a website very early on. As soon as the internet came out, I had a website up and I was getting 30,000 hits a month. This is in the early 1990s. A lot of people were coming at me with a pretty large family, five brothers and sisters and a lot of friends because they all have friends too. I had a pretty large network of people. I w- wanted to choose cases that I, I thought were the most extensive, not just simple sightings, because you get hundreds of those, and they only contain so much information. I wanted cases that had a lot of meat to them, really extensive cases with multiple witnesses, hopefully, different types of ETs. I also kind of shied away from cases involving hypnotic regression. The vast majority of the cases in this book, one or two involve a little bit of hypnosis, but most, no. Um, I think 
it works. Don't get me wrong. I support it. But it's got controversies surrounding it. False memory syndrome, this sort of thing. It's important because a lot of people think, oh, these are just hypnotically retrieved memories. Nothing could be further from the truth. I would now like to ask you about some of those cases. Here goes. What, Preston, can you tell me about the case of four men who encountered a UFO and experienced missing time, but each returned with different memories of the event? Is this unique or does it happen often where a number of people are abducted at the same time, missing time, but they come back, but their memories are different? This does happen fairly regularly. I mean, a lot of the stuff they recalled was absolutely matching up and corroborating each other's testimony, but it's not at all unusual for people to have slight variations in their testimony. But in some cases, as in this one, there was some very (laughs) marked differences, which I think points to how extensive this encounter was. The main witness I talked to was Rob Baldwin, who I met down in San Diego when I went there to speak at a convention. He's like, I have a story for you. I'm like, lay it on me. I'd love to hear it. And he described this amazing story, this experience, which took place in Michigan. He and his friends had heard about UFOs in the area and were just driving around and they parked on this road, a farmer's lane, which has got trees on both sides, a canopy over the, the road. And there's a little dip in the road, which goes quite down about 10 feet, perhaps 50 feet long. And they liked it because you could hide there and traffic on either side couldn't see you. So they just parked their little pickup truck there and were just spending the evening. There's not a whole lot to do where they lived. It was a pretty rural area. Without warning, this egg-shaped object appeared right at the lip, right at the edge of this little gully they were in in the road, this dip in the road, and stopped. And it was large. It was a large egg-shaped object about the size of a, a room like a large bathroom, perhaps, or a bedroom, was vertical in orientation, and it had swirling colors around it. He said it was absolutely beautiful, swirling reds, oranges, and yellows, and this strange kind of cloudy mist or fog surrounding it. And it was kind of a standoff. This object just stood there and looked at them. They had the sense that there were things inside there, people, entities of some kind, and they stared right back at it. It went on, they couldn't say precisely how long, and that was my first clue because they said there was a sense of timelessness about it. And that is often an indication that this could be a more extensive encounter. Also, the fact that it was so darn close. I mean, this thing was right there. They were maybe 20, 30 feet away at the most. And that's when Rob, who was in the driver's seat, (laughs) decided that he's going to chase this thing. And he turned on the truck, pressed down the gas pedal, and took off after it. This thing immediately zoomed down the road. Now, by the time they got to the top of this little dip in the road, which is less than five seconds, two, three seconds tops. They come up to the road. They can see just this orange yellow streak about a mile down the road. And this object went straight up through the canopy in the trees and was gone. And that was his kind of UFO story that he always told. He hadn't really considered the possibility of missing time until years later when he started reading about this sort of thing. He's like, huh, perhaps he had moved to California. So he kind of lost touch with the witnesses until he had a high school reunion. And he's like, I'm going to go there. I'm going to find my friends because they he found out they were going and he got an incredible shock when he talked to them. One guy had no memory of the event whatsoever. He did not remember it, which is, seems impossible considering the enormity of this experience. But we do see this. The second guy said, oh yeah, I remember that. Some guy was on the side of the road with a flashlight. He was just joking with us. And Rob's like, <laughs> that's not what happened at all. He kind of just discarded that guy's memory because it, there's no way he could have mistaken this huge egg-shaped object for a flashlight. But it was the third guy whose recall was really different and a little more extensive. And it absolutely shocked Rob because this guy said, oh yeah, I do remember that incident. And what happened was this object moved off the road out into the field and we all followed it. We walked out into the field and Rob has no memory of that. And that to me was a huge red flag of missing time. And that's when I started to question Rob about his own experience throughout life. Contact usually starts when you're a young child. And that's what I asked him. I'm like, I don't suppose you had any other unexplained experiences when you were much younger, say around age five, six, or seven. And he gave me this look like, well, as a matter of fact, yes, I did. I don't really like to talk about it. But since you asked, he remembers seeing these little figures in his bedroom. He didn't get a good look at him. It was dark, but he said it happened a number of times. And he does connect it to this because he ended up educating himself about the UFO 
phenomena, missing time and all of this and realizes, yeah, <laughs> he was probably taken that night. But it's amazing to me how they had such different memories of the same event. You, Preston, relate the case of a girl who had a close encounter with a UFO and years later when she grew into womanhood and became a mother, both she and her son are visited by an entity. What took place during that encounter? This was a really interesting case involving a lady by the name of Laura Kagoy, who was with her friend Ruthie on a pretty busy street in, uh, I think this was Missouri, Cermak Street, Illinois, that's right, in Cicero, Illinois, sorry, uh, but a really interesting case. I, I interviewed Laura face-to-face, -face, so I was able to get a good interview about her experiences, and when she was a little girl, this was in 1966, and she and her friend Ruthie had spent the weekend together. It was a Sunday evening, and it was time for Lori to go home, so she was waiting outside with Ruthie in their parents' station wagon until Laura's mother could come pick her up in the evening around 9 p.m. And they're just laying there in the car waiting when Laura hears this strange thrumming noise, a loud kind of humming, low throbbing noise. And she's looking around to see where this is coming from. And she's like, asks her friend, Ruthie, do you hear that? And Ruthie is passed out and is not waking up, even though Laura is calling her name over and over again. Ruthie, Ruthie. So Laura gets out of the car and gets her first shock is that there was no traffic. There was no traffic anywhere. This is a busy street. There should be traffic. There's always traffic. That was very puzzling to her. And lo and behold, here comes this huge craft, which she said was kind of shaped like an Oreo cookie. In many ways, a classic flying saucer, but sort of flattish and had a central band of windows. And she could see right inside this thing. She said it was right above the telephone wires, just low, 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 close enough where she could have hit it with a rock. And it came just lazily right down the center of the street towards her. And she was absolutely astonished because she could see inside the craft. She didn't see any beings, just this orange kind of light and these big picture windows all around the craft. And she looked down at the street and there were three people there, two old ladies in, a, in flower dresses and another lady who was wearing dark wraparound sunglasses, which she thought was weird, <laughs> at night and had hair that was black and greased back and looked almost fake. And she's like, that's weird. And she's like, look, look at this thing. Isn't this amazing? They did not really react. They showed no interest in this UFO and instead were staring at her. They were more interested in her and her reaction than in this huge craft. This made zero sense. And later I think there's, I've got something to say about that. But so this craft <laughs> moves over and she's absolutely amazed. So she chases it down the street because it's moving at less than five miles per hour, fast enough where she can keep up with it on her feet. And she follows it for just mm, a half of a block or so until there's a T intersection and it continues going straight so she wasn't able to follow it she almost knocked on you know, the door of the house there and wanted to run through their yard to follow this thing but she didn't she just watched this thing move off into the distance she went back to the station wagon and saw ruthie lying there and just very softly said ruthie ruthie shot up like a bullet just jumped up and she said did you see did you see the craft and of course she didn't but that was strange that ruthie kind of lost consciousness this is a thing we see so i feel like perhaps the ETs knocked her out because this often happens. And of course, at this point, all the traffic came back, all the sounds. It was eerily quiet. She ran inside, told Ruthie's parents. They're like, why didn't you come inside? <laughs> she said, it, it just, I don't know. It happened so fast. She saw, you know, it was about five minutes, the whole sighting. And I'm talking to her about it. I'm like, tell me about these weird, you know, these people you saw. She says, I don't know. It was so strange. That lady, her skin was so pale. It was almost white. And that's when it clicked on me because she's describing dark dark wraparound sunglasses. This reminds me of a gray type ET. She said really tight clothes, pale, pale skin, looked almost waxy. She said the hair didn't look real. And I don't know why she was wearing wraparound dark sunglasses at night. I think this could very well be a quote screen memory of a gray. I can't say for sure. She's not sure either, but this was her childhood encounter. She's not sure if she had missing time. Uh, it's possible. She didn't really know what to think of it until years later when she moved to California. California, and her son started saying that he's seeing things coming into his bedroom. And she's like, what do you mean things? And he said, they have kind of like weasel rat-like faces. They've got big dark eyes. They came into my room. They said, don't be afraid. We won't hurt you. And the next thing he knew, he was being floated up out of his room, through the wall, into the backyard. He says, mom, they cut my finger and sh showed him a little cut. Now he started having nosebleeds. So was she. Uh, she had se started seeing UFOs. Her husband saw 
saw a UFO. So all of this was going on at once. And this is when she started to connect the dots. Like, could this be UFOs? Her son says, Mom, I, the bony crab monster came and got me again. That's what he called it, the bony crab monster. There weren't a lot of terms for greys. Certainly back then it wasn't super popular, but it was a very interesting case. And it got even more interesting when she told me, you know, I have a memory from early childhood that might be connected to this, but it's so bizarre. I'm a little bit reluctant to tell you about it. I'm like, that's okay. You know, I probably heard this sort of thing before. Tell me what you remember. Maybe we can make sense of it. Because she's describing a childhood encounter. And I'm like, okay, here we go again. Always starts when you're very young. And she was about five or six years old and remembers, get this, a Harlequin type figure, like a clown coming into her bedroom. And she said it had purple and yellow kind of velvety costume, a little hat, and she could hear these bells ringing. And she's looking at it and there were no bells on it. And the next thing she knows, she's undressed. She's lying on a table. She saw a surgical type instrument coming at her. Basically, is describing your typical sort of examination type procedure. And she's like, could this possibly be related? And I had to tell her yes, because at that point I had heard other people describe these clown-like figures. Sometimes these ETs will come into a child's room, usually a child, dressed up or like a clown, or perhaps this is a screen memory. <laughs> I don't think so. I think they're actually projecting this image of a clown on purpose, because I have several cases like that. And I researched it, and it turns out this is a thing. Bud Hopkins, you know, the famous researcher, said that he had several cases where ETs would dress up as clowns and that a lot of contactees have this dread fear of clowns. It's called chlorophobia. <laughs> it's very prominent in our society. You know, it's a sort of end note to all this. I once went to a contactee support group with Barbara Lamb, a very well-known researcher. I'm like, hey guys, you know, all the contactees were there. I'm like, what do you think about clowns? <laughs> I may as well have set off an atom bomb because they all started screaming like, oh my God, I hate clowns. <laughs> oh, they're horrible. I have a huge fear of clowns. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of clowns either. <laughs> but Bud Hopkins hypothesized that it was their big, scary black eyes and painted faces, which are often white, that sort of trigger this emotional response. I think it might be more than that. I think they're actually using this as a sort of way to reduce the fear factor, but it's kind of backfiring a little bit because I have many cases like this, which are perhaps not clowns, but superheroes. Uh, one lady, she told me that the greys came in and they looked like three foot, four foot tall teddy bears. And she kind of saw through that and realized these were greys. But yeah, Barbie dolls, you name it. They do this sort of thing. So I think that case in that regard shows an important detail about the nature of ET contact. When a farmer reported seeing UFOs over his farm, two of his friends went to check it out. They ended up being followed by UFOs. One of the men was struck by a beam of light, and that was the beginning of an ordeal that haunts him for the rest of his life. What happened during that encounter? This is another really interesting encounter uh, in the Ann Arbor, Michigan area, involving a gentleman who I, I know quite well. I had him over to my house. I'm still in touch with him. Really neat guy. He's very tall, by the way. <laughs> he's like over six, he's six and a half feet tall, white blonde hair, very large eyes. He looks a little like a hybrid to me. <laughs> he really does. The sweetest guy, a musician, an actor, an airplane mechanic uh, later on in life. But he was just a teenager when he heard about this farmer in the area who said UFOs were regularly visiting his farm. And then word came in that the UFOs were back. So he hops into his truck with a friend and off they go to this farm. And he says it was the strangest thing because the whole town was there. The streets were just filled with cars. They were pulling over. It was a carnival-like atmosphere. The media showed up, a major news station, and there were these craft there, these lights, a lot of them, with kind of this yellow-orange marbling color, very much like what the other guy described, Rob Baldwin, except these were much higher up, and there was a lot of them. And he says, you know, I'm not sure if this was multiple craft or just lights or lights attached to a craft. It was kind of hard to say because they were somewhat off in the distance. But he said it was amazing because there must have been 100, 200 people there and everyone's ooing and eyeing when suddenly they weren't. He said this weird
weird sort of, I don't even know how to describe it. The mood changed and everyone's kind of went from astonishment to like, oh, well, time to go home and just started driving away. Like seeing a UFO is no big deal. And in fact, a lot of these people forgot about it. They did not remember it. So that was interesting. He was amazed. He's absolutely amazed. And he drives off with his friend to return home and they're driving along and they see another UFO, perhaps one of the same. It's sending down beams into the forest next to them. And we're thinking, is this a helicopter? It can't be a helicopter. There's nothing out here. What it would be, what would it be looking for? It, that makes no sense. Then they're driving along and then they see another UFO. It's hovering over the high school, the local high school there. Very strange. So he drops off his friend and he's heading home. Suddenly he's just driving along, notices that the stars behind him are disappearing. And this darkness is kind of descending over the whole area around him. And it's freaking him out. So he stops his pickup, gets out of the car and gets a huge shock because this enormous craft is hovering right over his car. And he says, I can't tell you how close it was. Couldn't have been more than a few hundred feet. But he says, this was like having the United Nations building hover right over you. That's how big it was. And there was just this sense of absolute eerie oppressiveness, just the weight of it alone. And all the cricket sounds stopped, no animal sounds whatsoever. And there were all these lights kind of blowing all over this thing. And the way he described it, he says, you know, cars have headlights and they come out of a little lens. This thing was shining down lights wherever it wanted to. It could make one part illuminate and then it wouldn't and another part would. And these were colored lights. He said it was really quite beautiful, but also a little eerie because it was close to him. And he's looking up at it and he says, at this point, a beam of light came out of it and came down and struck him. He was standing in front of his car and he says he felt like he could almost physically feel the beam. He says it felt like it went right through him and that it was scanning him or measuring him, perhaps in some way communicating. He didn't get any message, nothing like that, but he says he could physically feel this beam. And in fact, he says he got this weird, almost coppery taste, copper melt like pennies, you know, in his mouth. And that was alarming. He's looking at his watch to make sure that he's not losing time or anything because he was concerned that they were going to take him. After just a brief moment, this beam retracted. It was just a little thin beam, not huge. And it retracted and this thing just went off. No sound really at all, just kind of maybe a thrumming noise. And uh, he was absolutely amazed. He drove home almost, in, you know, hysterics, not quite, but rushed into the house and told his mom, like, you're not going to believe it. I just saw a bunch of UFOs like four times. <laughs> His mom didn't believe him. That really upset him. She's like, you're doing drugs. He's like, I don't do drugs. Um, mom, I saw this. You know, he's st still a teenager at this point. He was, I think, 17 years old. That upset him. So he decided he was going to go into the barn, into the hayloft, and play his guitar to just process this, relax, think about what happened. This is so interesting, because this was a crystal clear night, a beautiful clear night. He goes into the hayloft, climbs up there, and is playing his guitar. And this is when he says events got a little confused for him because he heard this loud buzzing noise, this thrumming, kind of the same thing that he had heard previously with one of these sightings. And he thought he went down to check it out. But the next thing he knows, he's up there on the hayloft and this sound is moving off into the distance. And so he jumps up, goes down the ladder, rows open the barn doors and got a huge shock. Area was completely socked in with fog, could not see a foot into it. So this was impossible. <laughs> it was absolutely a clear night. There's no way the fog could have swept in that quickly. So it's clear he had missing time and uh, he didn't know what to make of it. This really kind of affected him emotionally for a very long time. And he had a lot of doubts about it and what had happened. And it was really hard for him to live with for a long time. He ended up moving to LA. He became an aircraft mechanic. He said it was strange because you know he's working in the military and he got stationed at Gulf Breeze <laughs> and then at Nellis Air Force Base and other places which were known for UFO activity. That kind of freaked him out. He eventually started photographing UFOs. Later, I found out he was seeing grays coming into his room. This was after I'd written his story, so <laughs> that part is not in the book. But yeah, he came over to my house and had this method for seeing UFOs, which he had kind of figured out that if you look into the corona of the sun by blocking out the disk of the sun itself, because we can't look into the sun, you'll go blind. Don't do this. I'm not recommending you look at the sun. But he had this method where 
if you just block off the disk of the sun, you could see weird objects in the corona. And sure enough, he did. And I did too. He showed me how to do this. And I had a really remarkable sighting. And so did my sister-in-law and other people. And he ended up getting some of his footage of UFOs on the television program Sightings. His story is truly amazing. It's still ongoing. He's still in contact. A really remarkable guy. His name is Jay. He did not want his last name used. A woman visits a person who channels ETs and gets more than she bargained for when the ETs return to her home and abduct her. Could you, Preston, elaborate on that event? This is an amazing story. Pat Brown is the witness. She's this beautiful lady, African-American heritage, ancestry, which I only say because people have told me, ah, you know, Black people aren't having encounters. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I've interviewed people of every ancestry, Asian, Pacific Islander, Latino, Caucasian, you name it. So I'm just going to get that out there. An amazing lady, super kind. I met her at a MUFON meeting and she started sharing her encounter. Uh, she was working with Barbara Lamb, the lady who I mentioned earlier, who's also an investigator. Pat did not believe in UFOs. She had no real interest in the subject at all, but her friend did. And her friend had moved to Sedona, Arizona, which is all about new age and UFOs and crystals and vortexes and all this kind of stuff that just didn't interest her. But her friend begged her and begged her, says, listen, there's these people who say they channel ETs. You should see them. They're really interesting. And finally, Pat relented and said, fine, I will come and visit and you can show me these channels. Channelers. And she did. She went to Sedona and visited this channeler. You know, channeling is, of course, when someone goes into a trance and allegedly speaks for an entity of some kind, a spirit, or in this case, allegedly, <laughs> an ET. Pat was kind of skeptical. She's like, okay, if you're truly an extraterrestrial, I would love to meet you. I would love to go on your ships. And the entity speaking through this gentleman said, fine, if this is what you want, we can arrange it. And she didn't think anything was going to happen, but she goes back to her home. This is in Pacoima in a condominium complex, mind you. So it's lots of people in this area. It's a densely populated area. A gray appeared in her bedroom and pulled her on board. And she says it was actually quite frightening. She found herself being physically examined. There was these two grays who were trying to calm her down and she wasn't having it. She was fighting them the whole way. She said she saw this little robotic sort of being moving around the table. So the inside of the craft was kind of bronzy called bronze-ish. And she said the air was different. It was kind of silky and thin. The texture of the atmosphere was somewhat different. And the greys were trying so hard to calm her down and said to each other, boy, she's different tonight. <laughs> that freaked her out. But she's like, what do you mean tonight? Have I, has this happened before? And she says for the next three months, this continued. And she got to the end of her rope. This was just not fun for her. It was harrowing. It was scary. She felt violated. She didn't like like it. And she reached a point where the fear was just exhausting her. And she says, I can't take this anymore. I need to know what's going on. If I'm truly having contact, I want to go on the craft right now on my terms and be fully conscious of everything that's going on. And just like that, like flipping a switch, she found herself on board and she had a very different experience. She was confronted by a human looking ET, very beautiful, wearing a jumpsuit, who proceeded to take her to her quarters. I found this very interesting because this does match up with some other accounts of people I've talked to where they describe they're, they're taken to the place that which is theirs. That's where they stay. She said it was very sparse, just a little bed and a sort of not a normal bed by any means, but a little sort of alcove thing for the little desk, very sparse. These are kind of gray silver walls. She said the whole experience was actually really pleasant. She met other beings up there. They took her up to the control room and showed her as they traveled through space. She could see a star field and all the stars moving. And she said she had the sense that she had been up there many times, that she was one of them. And he proceeded to tell her all kinds of information. Uh, actually, at some point, she had what she believes might actually be an astral projection experience, an interdimensional experience, where he, they took her and showed her the negative bands of energy that are surrounding our planet. And she said it was dark and dense. And they told her, these are all the, this is the greed, this is the anger, this is the hate, that you are all putting out. This is choking your planet. Uh, this is a message they often give people about the dangers of the way our, our ways of thinking, the negativity that we're embroiled in. They showed her the sort of masculine and 
feminine parts of her body. They told her how to astral project. They talked about her past lives. It was a very spiritual experience for her. And following that, her experiences changed markedly. They became pretty much positive. She says she still feels a little bit of a sense of violation. She did have what we call the missing fetus syndrome, where she lost a baby and the doctors could not find the fetus. So possibly she does have a hybrid child uh, because we do see this. And that is what kind of puts her a little bit on the fence with her experiences. But as an end note, this is really interesting because people often experience a huge spiritual awakening as a result of their encounter. And that certainly happened to her. At the time her encounter started, she was working as a telephone operator. It was a boring, unfulfilling career. She's like, I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm going to change my life. And she became a physical therapist, a massage therapist doing healing work. And she started to get really successful at it, had a lot of referrals because she was healing people in a way that really worked. She got a lot of really good testimonials. People said they could see blue light coming out of her hands as she did her healing work. And she says, Preston, it's so strange because while I'm doing this, the grays will come to my mind. I can see them in my mind's eye up on their craft and they're assisting. They're helping me do it. And I thought that was super interesting because healing and learning how to heal is something many contactees report. And that was off the charts in her case. Just the nicest lady. So I think her case is so important because it shows how someone can start in a, just a place of fear and confusion and move to a place of understanding and positivity and getting the best out of your encounters. Should viewers of Paranormal Yakker want to buy extraterrestrial visitations, true accounts of UFO contact, and learn about other books you've written, many of them bestsellers? How can they do that? Uh, my books are available on Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, other online retailers. I have a website as well, which you can read excerpts of the book or contact me if you'd like, if you have a story to share or a question or a comment. I always love hearing from people. I'm all over social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I do have a YouTube channel where I'm putting out a lot of my research for people who don't have the time or inclination to read. But yeah, I really appreciate you having me on the show. I think this is an important subject. So I'm very happy that you gave me this opportunity. Thank you. Preston Dennett, I thank you for being my guest on Paranormal Yakker. As always, it's been a pleasure yakking with you. Pleasure is all mine. Stan, thank you. Hi, everyone. This is Stan Mallow, the Paranormal Yacker. I hope you enjoyed part one of my interview with Preston Dennett. In part two, he'll be talking about many more amazing firsthand accounts of UFO contacts that are in his book, Extraterrestrial Visitations. So that you don't miss it or any of my other upcoming interviews, be sure to subscribe to my free YouTube channel. To do that, just press the subscribe button on your screen. I very much appreciate your support of my channel and thank you for doing it.